British Columbia, land of contrasts, mighty snow-capped mountains, green and fertile valleys, calm crystal lakes and turbulent rivers coursing their way to the sea, where deep and picturesque inlets and fjords knife their way into its western coastline. These great mountains that run almost sheer down to the sea are eternally covered with snow. As the snow melts, it starts streams far below. And in these streams that flow into mighty rivers are spawned the salmon that form half the province's $40 million a year fishing industry. The life story of a salmon is one of the most fascinating, almost unbelievable stories of a bounteous nature. Salmon always go back to the stream where they were born when it comes time for them to continue the species. Four years they are in the ocean, hundreds of miles from the rivers where they first swam. When spawning time approaches, back they go. Nothing save death will stop them. Up these rushing, foaming waters over jagged rocks and rapids, such determination is extraordinary. Man has helped in this spawning migration, this fight to the place of birth. Too many obstacles and the fish just can't make it. The eggs won't be laid and a great natural asset, a rich natural resource, could well be ruined. At Hell's Gate on the Fraser River, Canada and the United States have combined to erect a million dollar fishway, one of the greatest on this continent. At rapids like these at Hell's Gate, the velocity and turbulence of the water is such that at times the migrating salmon have difficulty in fighting through. Obstructions like these can cause untold losses. These specially designed fishways reduce velocities so that the fight is not so hard for the salmon to reach the spawning grounds above. Again, at Bridge River Rapids, fishways have been erected to assist the salmon around these mighty maelstroms. And on other streams, fish ladders, so that the fish may climb step by step. Salmon surmount unbelievable obstacles on their way to the spawning beds. Some races traveling as far as 700 miles from the sea to the headwaters of the Fraser River. If salmon cannot reach the spawning ground in which they themselves were spawned, they will accept no other, but will die without spawning. Just look at that fellow's determination. He's going to make it or know the reason why. There he goes, try after try, until he's over, heading for the spawning grounds. They may have quiet water for a time, and then possibly more rapids, until at last, worn and weary, they reach the spawning grounds to fulfill their destiny, the procreation of their kind. The spawning grounds are quietly running waters far upstream in the shadow of the woods. When the fish reach there, they pair off, and in doing so, members of the same sex battle fiercely for position and their mates. This seems to be a fight to the finish. They're vicious. Both have their eyes on the same female. But as in all affairs of this sort, one or the other is eventually the winner. And now this pair commences the perpetuation of the species. As the female lays her eggs, she lies on her side, flapping her body violently on the stony bottom. The male in the background, slightly downstream, quietly watches. When the eggs are laid, a few at a time, they sink to the bottom. Then the male moves over them, vigorously twitching his body in a movement almost too rapid to see. The milt, thus released, fertilizes the eggs, and so has begun the life of a salmon. The fertilized eggs become buried in the gravel at the bottom of the stream until spring comes, when the little ones will swim away from their birthplace to return in four or five years' time when they are mature to perform the same operation. 
Spawning lasts about three weeks, and in that time the female lays from 2,500 to 3,000 eggs, and then the parents die, their mission in life complete. The salmon fishing and canning business of British Columbia, worth $17 million a year, has two types of fishing boats that operate in these long, fjord-like arms of the sea that run sometimes a hundred miles into the mountains. These gillnet boats tied up at a cannery are about 30 feet long and are powered by internal combustion engines with a one or two man crew. Generally, gillnetting is a one man operation. Nets are a valuable part of any fishing boat. Gill nets are made of linen, with a cork line at one edge and a lead line at the other. The web is woven with meshes of suitable size for the kind of salmon being fished. In summer, many women find employment making and mending the nets. This one is seen hanging the cork line, the corks being floats made of cedar. The cork line serves to keep one edge of the net floating at the surface. The lead line is hung in a similar manner with leads for weight to keep that edge of the net down in the water. When a gill net is fishing, it may be likened to a mesh fence extending down from the surface. In the process of fishing, gill nets become torn and must be repaired lest the fish go through the hole. From the drum on which it is wound goes the net, paid out over the stern, yards and yards of it, generally crosswise of the river or inlet up which the salmon are migrating. And when the net is all out in a straight line, it is allowed to drift. On the end of each net is a flag with markings denoting the cannery for which the boat is fishing. It's up to the fisherman to decide how long he allows his net to drift. And when he has decided the time is up, in comes the net. A tedious job, but one filled with suspense. The fisherman never knows what the result will be, but hopes for the best. For fish mean money, and a hard job should pay well. The fisherman guides the net on the drum. Lead line, cork line, and web are all pulled in together, just like a heavy rope, but so carefully that when it goes out again, all will work smoothly. For fishing is an orderly, highly technical process, even though chances must now and then be taken. These gill nets catch the salmon as it swims upstream. The mesh is of a size that permits the fish to get its head and part of its body through, but not large enough to permit the fish to go all the way through. When the salmon are migrating upstream, nothing will stop them. They cannot be diverted, as we have seen before. When they encounter a net, they persist in going on, and go they will until they are caught. The catch is delivered to the cannery daily. In usually placid waters along a magnificent coast of tall timbers, snowy mountains, and wonderful beaches, the purse seine vessels ply their trade. Purse saners are much larger than gillnet boats, from 40 to 60 feet long, and carry a crew of about seven men. Generally, they are powered by diesel engines. It is interesting and educational to follow a complete cycle of operations, from the time the fish are caught 
until the catch is neatly packed in shiny cans ready for export to all the world. Let us follow this seine boat while making a set. Maneuvering on a school of fish, the skipper decides where to commence casting the seine for best results. When in position, operations begin. The net is paid out, running off the turntable as the vessel goes ahead, the weight of the net in the water hauling it out. The name purse seine comes from the fact that the great net is like an old-fashioned purse, opening and closing in much the same way, with a rope running through rings fastened to the bottom of the net, similar to a drawstring in a shopping bag. When the net is all out, it is in the form of a semicircle in the water. To keep the fish from swimming around the end of the net, these men splash the water with weighted sticks fastened to the ends of ropes. There are tricks to all trades, and the trick here is to keep the fish in the net while the end is still open. While the men continue to splash, the seine boat slowly moves forward, towing the end of the net and being guided so as to return to the point of commencement, thus bringing both ends of the net together. When the two ends of the net have been brought together, the next step in the operation is pursing up, that is hauling in on the purse line which is threaded through rings fastened to the bottom of the net. Powerful winches do this job. Again, the orderly process of fishing comes in. The purse line is as carefully handled as you do your garden hose. It is neatly coiled on deck, each end in a different coil, so that when the net is being hauled in, the purse line can be run through the ring. and stowed on the turntable with the net. Slack in the cork line is taken care of by temporarily piling it on the turntable and on a smaller boat called the seine skiff. In this way, there is less danger of the web becoming entangled in the ship's propeller, which would be a first-class tragedy. When the purse line has been all hauled in and the purse rings come to the surface, the net is closed and any salmon within its confines cannot now escape. The winch hauls in the bottom of the net, oh so carefully, because the weight is enormous. There is a ton or so of lead to be handled, as well as the fish and web. And as these nets cost from four to six thousand dollars, the fishermen handle them most carefully. Any break in the net and the fish will escape. Preparations for hauling the net in are intricate. The purse rings and purse line previously mentioned are laid on the deck in orderly fashion so that all may be easily stowed. Slack in the purse line is fed through the rings and the turntable is swung around with the roller over the side of the vessel to facilitate hauling. In hauling the seine, the last part out is the first in, and as the net is hauled, the fish are gradually confined in a smaller space. 
The web, cork line and lead line, together with the purse line, are all stowed on the turntable in an orderly manner, so that when the net is finally all on board, everything is in readiness for another set. When the net is being hauled inboard, the roller on the turntable is driven by power from the main engine. This helps a good deal, but even with this assistance, this is back-breaking work and is no place for weaklings. The lead line and purse line are neatly coiled together in readiness for the next set. Finally, the net is all back on the turntable except the portion which surrounds the catch. The slack cork line, which was gathered up on the small boat, is gradually all stowed in its proper place. And now commences another phase of the operation, bringing the catch to the surface. Such flapping and splashing, and glint of sun on silvery bodies, and churning of salty waters. And then into the jumbled mass goes the brailer, a great basket of net to pick the fish out of the water after they have been dried up in a very small bag of the big net. Now into the hold. Now and then a fish gets out of the brailer, but not for long. A real fisherman never lets one get away if he can help it, any more than you would if you were trolling from your rowboat. Here is sport and the spirit of conquest, as well as money in the pockets of the fishermen. Each brailer holds about 100 fish, weighing approximately six or seven pounds each as a rule, so it's quite a bag full, worth its weight when the payoff comes. British Columbia's canneries are located close to the fishing grounds so that long hauls can be obviated. For fish are perishable and freshness is a must in maintaining the high quality of British Columbia's canned salmon. Salmon canneries are self-contained little villages strategically located up and down the coast all the way from the United States border to Alaska. British Columbia's salmon canneries are as modern as tomorrow as soon as the vessel arrives at a cannery, its cargo is unloaded, mostly by machinery. The fish are handled on conveyors, similar to an escalator, which reach right into the hold of the vessel. Talk about your modern methods. A ledge for each fish, just as you have your own step in a department store escalator. From the time the salmon arrive at a cannery until they are packed in shiny cans, the emphasis is on speed, for time is the enemy of quality. Inside the cannery, the fish are diverted into bins. Butchering isn't done by hand anymore, not in British Columbia's canneries. Grim-looking machines, known to the trade as iron chinks, do that job. The whole cannery is something like a streamlined factory, with the assembly line as the most efficient way of handling an involved process. First, the heads are taken off, and the rest of the fish passes right along the assembly line. Fed into the main machine, tail first, the salmon's ventral fins are first removed, after which the fish is split and the entrails removed. Scales and blood are scraped off and finally the tail is removed and the salmon, thus cleaned, proceeds along the assembly line.
The iron chink does a good job of cleaning, but despite this, every fish is examined individually. Women inspectors, shining with cleanliness, proud of their part in preparing this food product, look over each fish as it comes from the iron chink. This job is done under running fresh water. The inside of each salmon is scrubbed. A knife flicks off any bits of blood and skin left over by the machine. By this time, the fish is ready for the can and the assembly line process starts once more. Onto more escalator-like affairs goes each fish. These machines, known as the gang knives, cut each fish in lengths so that the pieces will fit perfectly into the can. Such even slicing, and then the pieces are delivered into a bin. From the bin, the cut pieces are placed on a conveyor, which is part of the filling machine for packing into the cans. These filling machines are mechanical marbles, placing the cut pieces of salmon in cans to within an ounce of the predetermined weight. The cans are fed to the filling machine from the floor above. The fish come in one way, the cans in another, and then the filled cans are discharged at the bottom of the machine. It's quick and steady work. These machines operate at about 120 cans a minute. different types of filling machines, this one is known as Big Bertha, the fish being fed in whole, tail of one fitted into the belly cavity of the one immediately ahead. More of the assembly line business. Regardless of the kind of filling machine used, the filled cans are next conveyed to the weighing machine. Every precaution is taken against a can of salmon being underweight. The carefully inspected weighing machine makes sure that when you buy a pound can of salmon, you are getting exactly that, one pound of British Columbia salmon. The weighing machine is so delicately balanced that it immediately spots any can with even a fraction of an ounce less than the required weight and any such can is immediately cast out on the inside track and is brought up to full weight before it is allowed to continue on the line. Next comes the salting, for fresh fish must have salt. The added salt has nothing to do with the preservation of the fish, but is exclusively for flavor. As the cans pass through this machine, a predetermined amount of salt is placed on the top of each can of salmon. Now the covers are placed on the can. This machine, known as the clincher, takes one cover at a time from the bottom of the pile and places it loosely on each can as it progresses through the machine. The loosely placed cover is crimped on so that it won't shake off, but the can is not yet sealed. Then to the vacuum closing machine, which hermetically seals each can with a vacuum. The cans, as they leave this machine, have been vacuum packed with all the rich flavor and vitamins for which British Columbia salmon is noted, sealed right in the can. Cooking is one of the most important parts of the whole canning process. After being hermetically sealed in the vacuum closing machine, the cans are loaded onto giant trays known as coolers. These are then piled onto small cars and off they go to the cookers.
The full cars, each holding about 25 cases of 48 cans, are transported to the enormous cookers, which when filled are closed and sealed steam tight. And for an hour and a half, the cans of salmon are cooked under live steam pressure at 260 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, the job of cooking completed, the pressure is released, the retorts are opened. And away go the processed fish to the warehouse. So hot are the cans that it takes 24 hours for them to cool. The cooled cans of salmon packed the day previous are next brought to the unscrambling machine which is used to unload the cans from the coolers or trays on which they were cooked. First put in right side up, then turned upside down and the tray removed, after which the scrambled cans proceed one following the other in an orderly manner to the labeling machine. Labeling is done in the packing room. After the cans leave the unscrambling machine, each rolls through the labeling machine, picking up a label as it does so. More assembly line fashion. Labeling is an important part of the salmon canning operation, for labels identify the product. British Columbia's canned salmon labels are favorably known throughout the world and are synonymous with the highest in quality. As the cans roll from the labeling machine, the labeled cans are packed into wooden cases or fiberboard cartons. Sometimes, however, the cans are packed without labels to be labeled later. In this case, the unlabeled cans are packed in wooden boxes by machine instead of by hand. Then on go the covers, well nailed down, again by machinery, and next into the warehouse by conveyor once more, from where they are shipped by truck, train or steamer to all parts of the world. The salmon fishery of British Columbia is an important part of the industrial life of the province. The salmon canning industry alone, which we have just witnessed, is worth in the neighborhood of $17 million a year to the people of British Columbia. Salmon fishing and canning gives employment to more than 15,000 persons, while over 9,000 boats are needed to catch the fish and transport them to the canneries. In addition to these, the industry gives employment indirectly to many others engaged in such industries as coastwise shipping, can making, shipbuilding, boat yards, machine shops, box making, to name but a few. The salmon canneries scattered up and down the coastline of British Columbia form the nucleus of many small settlements. While British Columbia canned salmon has helped to spread British Columbia's name far and wide. In many parts of the world, canned salmon and British Columbia are synonymous terms. British Columbia canned salmon is exceptionally high in vitamins and many of the essential minerals and contains more food value pound for pound than beef, hen's eggs, whole milk and many other foods. From spawning in placid streams to packing for shipment through the fascinating business of the actual fishing in the blue and green waters amid some of the world's finest scenery through the modern methods of canning to the warehouse and thence to the world. Such is the story of salmon fishing and canning in British Columbia. <laughs>